Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Jamie, Lily Ostara, and Chloe. And as always, I want to remind you, please stay safe, healthy, hit that like button, subscribe, and comment below. And in this video, we are going to get into, start reading Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, something a little different for a change. And without further ado, let's get there. All right, Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, and we are on chapter one. I read a few chapters, so. Lewis Creed, who had lost his father at three, and who had never known a grandfather, never expected to find a father as he entered his middle age, but that was exactly what happened. Although we call this man a friend, as a grown man must do when he finds the man who should have been his father relatively late in life. He met this man on the evening he and his wife and his two children moved into the big white frame house in Ludlow. Winston Churchill moved in with them. Church was his daughter Eileen's cat. The search, uh, the search committee at the university had moved slowly. The hunt for a house within commuting distance of the university had been hair-raising, and by the time they neared the place where he believed the house to be, all the landmarks are right, uh, like the astrological signs the night before Caesar was assassinated. Lewis thought morbidly they were all tired and tense and on edge. Gage was cutting teeth and fussed almost ceaselessly. He would not sleep. No matter how much Rachel sang to him, she offered him the breast, e though, even though it was off his schedule. Gage knew his dining schedule as well as she. Better, maybe, and he promptly bit her with his new teeth. <laughs> Rachel, still not entirely sure about this move to Maine from Chicago, where she had lived her whole life, burst into tears. Eileen promptly joined her. In the back of the station wagon, Church continued to pace restlessly as he had done for the last three days. It had taken them to drive here from Chicago. His yowling from the cat kennel had been bad, but his restless pacing after they finally gave up and set him free in the car had been almost as unnerving. Lewis himself felt a little like crying. It wild but not unattractive idea suddenly came to him. He would suggest that they go back to Bangor for something to eat while they waited for the moving van. And when his three hostages, the fortune got out, he would floor the accelerator and drive away without so much as a look back. Foot to the mat, the wagon's huge four-barrel carburetor gobbling expensive gasoline. He would drive south all the way to Orlando, Florida, where he would get a job at Disney World as a medic, under a new name. But before he hit the turnpike, big old 95 southbound, he would stop by the side of the road and put the fucking cat out, too. Then they rounded a final curve, and, that, and there was the house that only he had seen up until now. He had flown out and looked at each, each of the seven possibles they had picked from photos once the position of the University of Maine was solidly his. And this was the one he had chosen, a big old New England colonial, but newly sized and insulated the heating costs. While horrible enough, were not out of line in terms of consumption. Three big rooms downstairs, four more up, a long shed that might be converted to more rooms later on. All of it surrounded by a luxuriant sprawl of lawn, lushly green even in this August heat. Beyond the house was a large field for the children to play in and beyond the field were woods that went on damn near forever. The property abutted state lands, the realtor had explained, and there would be new, no development in the foreseeable future. The remains of the Micmac Indian tribe had laid claim to nearly 8,000 acres in Ludlow and in the towns east of Ludlow, and the complicated litigation involving the federal government as well as that of the state might stretch into the next century. Rachel stopped crying abruptly. She sat up. Is that... That's it. Lewis said. He felt apprehensive. No, he felt scared. In fact, he felt terrified. He had mortgaged 12 years of their lives for this. It wouldn't be paid off until Eileen was 17. He swallowed. What do you think? I think it's beautiful, Rachel said. And that was a huge weight off his chest and off his mind. She wasn't kidding. He saw it. Saw it, in the, saw it was in the way she was looking at it as they turned in the asphalted driveway that curved around to the shed and back, her eyes sweeping in the black wind 
blank windows, her mind always already ticking away at such matters as curtains, excuse me, as curtains, a little blurry vision there, an oil cloth for the cupboards and God knew what else. Daddy, Ellie said from the back seat, she had stopped crying as well, even Gage had stopped fussing. Lewis savored the silence. What, love? Her eyes brown under the darkish blonde hair in the rearview mirror also surveyed the house. The lawn, the roof of another house off to the left in the d distance, and the big field stretching up to the woods. Is this home? It's going to be, honey, he said. Hooray, she shouted, almost taking his ear off. And Lewis, who could sometimes become very irritated with Ellie, decided he didn't care if he ever clapped an eye on Disney World in Orlando. He parked in front of the shed and turned off the wagon's motor. The engine ticked. In the silence, which seemed very big after Chicago and the bustle of State Street in the loop, a bird sang sweetly in the late afternoon. Home, Rachel said softly, still looking at the house. Home, Gage said complacently on her lap. Lewis and Richard stared each Rachel stared at each other. In the rear view mirror, Eileen's eyes widened. Did you? Did he? Was that? They all spoke together, they, then all laughed together. Gage took no notice. He only continued to suck his thumb. He'd been saying ma for almost a month now. It had taken a stab or two at something that might have been da or only wishful thinking on Lewis's part. But this, either by accident or limitation, had been a real world home, word, home. Lewis plucked Gage from his wife's lap and hugged him. That was how they came to Ludlow. Chapter two. Chapter two. In Lewis Creed's memory, that one moment always held a magical quality, partly because, perhaps because it really was magical, but mostly because the rest of the evening was so wild. In the next three hours, neither peace nor magic made an appearance. Lewis had stored the house keys away neatly. He was a neat a methodical man was Lewis Creed, in a small manila envelope which he had labeled Ludlow House. Keys received June 29th. He put the keys away in the Fairlane's glove compartment. He was absolutely sure of that. Now they weren't there. While he hunted for them, growing increasingly irritated, Rachel hoisted Gage onto her hip and followed Eileen over to the tree in the field. He was checking under the seats for the third time when his daughter screamed and then began to cry. Lewis, Rachel called. She's cut herself. Her cut herself. Eileen had fallen from the tire swing and hit a rock with her knee. The cut was shallow, but she was screaming like someone who had just lost a leg. If kids do that. Lewis thought a bit in generously. He glanced at the house across the road where a light burned in the living room. All right, Ellie, he said. That's enough. Those people over there will think someone's being murdered. But it hurts, Lewis shr shr struggled with his temper and went silently back to the wagon. The keys were gone, but the first aid kit was still in the glove compartment. He got, got it and came back. When Ellie saw it, she began to scream louder than ever. No, not the stingy stuff. I don't want the stingy stuff, Daddy. No, Eileen, it's just mercurochrome, and it doesn't sting. Be a big girl, Rachel said. It's just no, 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 no. You want to stop that or you will, your ass will sting, Lewis said. She's tired, Lou, Rachel said quietly. Yeah, I know the feeling. Hold her leg out. Rachel put Gage down and held Eileen's leg, which Lewis painted with mercurochrome in spite of her increasingly hysterical wails. Someone just came on the porch of that house across the street, Rachel said. She picked Gage up. He had started to crawl away through the grass. Wonderful, Lewis muttered. Lou, she's tired, I know. <coughs> He tapped the mercurochrome and looked grimly at his daughter. There, get my drink here. And it really didn't hurt a bit. Fess up, Ellie. It does, it does hurt, it hurt. His hand itched to slap her and he grabbed his leg hard. Did you find the keys, Rachel asked? Not yet, Lewis said, snapping the first aid kit closed and getting up. I'll... Gage began to scream. He was not fussing or crying, but really screaming, writhing in Rachel's arms. What's wrong with him? Rachel cried, thrusting him almost blindly at Lewis. It was, he supposed, one of the advantages of having married a doctor. You should shove the kid at your hus 
You shoved the kid at your husband whenever the baby seemed to be dying. Lewis, what's... The baby was grabbing frantically at his neck, screaming wildly. Lewis flipped him over and saw an angry white knob raising, rising on the side of Gage's neck. There was also something on the strap of his jumper, something fuzzy, squirming weakly. Eileen, who had become quieter, began to scream again. Bee, 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 she jumped back, tripped over the same protruding rock on which he had already come a cropper, sat down hard and began to cry in mingled pain, surprise, and fear. I'm going crazy. Lewis, can't you do something? Lewis thought wonderingly. Wee! Do something, Lewis. Can't you do something? Got to get the stinger out of voice behind the drawl. That's the ticket. Get the stinger out. Put some baking soda on it. Bump will go down. But the voice was so thick with down east accent that for a moment Lewis's tired, confused mind refused to translate the dialect. Got to get the stinger out and put some baking soda on it till go to go down. I know the main dialect. He turned and saw an old man of perhaps 70, a hale and healthy 70, standing there on the grass. He wore a bibbles over a blue chambray shirt that showed his thickly folded and wrinkled neck. His face was sunburned, and he was smoking an unfiltered filtered cigarette. As Lewis looked at him, the old man pinched the cigarette out between his thumb and forefinger and pocketed it neatly. He held out his hands and smiled crookedly. A smile Lewis liked at once, and he was not a man who took to people. I have to tell you your business, Doc, he said. And that was how Lewis met Judson Crandall. <coughs> Excuse me. The man who should have been his father. And we're into chapter three. Okay. Chapter three. He had watched them arrive from across the street and had come across to see if he could help when it seemed they were in a bit of a tight, as he put it. While Lewis held the baby on his shoulder... Crandall stepped near, looking at the swelling on Gage's neck, and reached out with one blocky, twisted hand. Rachel opened her mouth to protest. His hand looked terribly clumsy and almost as big as Gage's head. But before she could say a word, the old man's fingers had made a single decisive movement as apt and deft as the fingers of a man walking cards across his knuckles, sending, hey, Lily, sending coins into conjurer's limbo. And the stinger lay in his palm. Big any remark. No prize winner, but it'll do for a ribbon, I guess. Lewis burst out laughing. Crandall regarded him with that crooked smile and said, Hey, ya, uh, corker, ain't she? What did he say, Mommy? Eileen asked, and then Rachel burst out laughing, too. Of course, it was terribly impolite. But somehow it was okay. Crandall pulled out a deck of Chesterfield Kings, poked one into the seamed corner of his mouth, nodded at them pleasantly as they laughed. Even Gage was chortling now, in spite of the swelling of the bee sting, and popped a wooden match light with his thumbnail. The old have their tricks, Lewis thought. Small ones, but some of them are good ones. He stopped laughing and held out the hand that wasn't suppo supporting Gage's bottom. Gage decidedly, Gage's decidedly damp bottom. I'm pleased to meet you, mister. Judd Crandley said and shook. You're the doc, I guess. Yes, Lewis, Lewis Creed, this is my wife, Rachel. My daughter Ellie and the kid with the bee sting is Gage. Nice to know all of you. I didn't mean to laugh, that is. We didn't come to mean to laugh. It's just that we are we are a little tired. That's the understatement of it. Caused him to that the understatement of it caused him to giggle again. He felt totally exhausted. Crandall nodded. Cush you are, he said, which came out Cush you are. He glanced at Rachel. Why don't you take your little Boy and your daughter over to the house for a minute. Mrs. Creed, we can put some baking soda on a wash rag and cool that off some. My wife would like to say hello, too. She don't get out too much. Arthritis got bad the last two or three years. Rachel glanced at Lewis, who's nodded. That would be very kind of you, Mr. Crandall. Oh, I just answered to Judd, he said. There was a sudden loud honk. A motor... A <laughs> I'm going back to my old dialect, too. A motor winding down, and then the big blue moving van was turning, lumbering into the driveway. Oh, Christ, and I don't know where the keys are, Lewis said. That's okay, Crandall said. I got a set. Mr. and Mrs. Cleveland, they that lived here before you, gave me a set. Oh, must have been 14, 15 years ago. They lived here a long time. Joan Cleveland was my wife's best friend. She died two years ago. Bill went on, 
to that old folks' apartment complex over in Orrington. I'll bring them back over. They belong to you now, anyway. You're very kind, Mr. Crandall, Rachel said. Not at all, he said. Looking forward to having youngins around again. Even that the sound of this... Even that the, except that the sound of this as exotic to their Midwestern ears as a foreign language was yawns, yawns. That's old-timer speak, though. You just want to watch them around the road, Mrs. Creed. Lots of big trucks on that road. Now there was the sound of slamming doors as the moving men hopped out of the cab and came toward them. Ellie had wandered away a little, and now she said, Daddy, what's this? Lewis, who had started to meet the moving men, glanced back at the edge of the field where the lawn stopped, and high summer grass took over. A path about four feet wide had been cut, smooth and close. It wound up the hill, curved through a, a low stand of bushes and a copse of birches and out of sight. Looks like a path of some kind, Lewis said. Oh, yeah, uh, Crandall said, smiling. Tell you about it sometime, Missy. She want to come over and we'll fix your baby brother up. Sure, Ellie said, and added with a certain hopefulness. Does baking soda sting? And we're on to chapter 10, uh, not 10, chapter 4. Okay. Crandall brought back the keys, but by then Lewis found his set. There was a space at the top of the glove compartment, and the small envelope had slipped down into the wiring. He fished it out and let the movers in. Crandall gave him the extra set. They were on an old tarnished fob. Lewis thanked him and slipped them absently into his pocket, watching the movers take in boxes and dressers and bureaus and all the other things they had collected over the ten years of their marriage. Seeing them this way out of their accustomed places, Diminished them, just <laughs> as my little, diminished them, just a bunch of stuff in boxes, he thought, and suddenly he felt sad and depressed. He guessed he was feeling what people call homesickness. Uprooted and transplanted, Crandall said, suddenly beside him, and Lewis jumped a little. You sound like you know the feeling, he said. No, actually, I don't, Crandall, little cigarette pop, went the match, flashing excuse me, flaring brightly in the first early evening shadows. My dad built that house across the way, brought his wife there, and she was taken with child there. That child was me, born in the very year 1900. That makes you 83, Crandall said, and Lewis was mildly relieved that he didn't add years young, a phrase he cordially detested. You look a lot younger than that, Crandall shrugged. Anyway, I've always lived there. I joined up when we fought the Great War, but the closest I got to Europe was beyond New Jersey. Nasty place. Even in 1917, it was a nasty place. I was just as glad to come back here. Got married to my Norma, put in my time on the railroad, and here we still are. But I've seen a lot of life right here in Ludlow. I sure have. The moving men stopped by the shed entrance, holding the box spring that, we that went under the big double bed he and Rachel shared. Where do you want this, Mr. Creed? Upstairs, just a minute, I'll show you. He started toward them, then paused for a moment and glanced back at the Crandall. Back at Crandall. You go on, Crandall said, smiling. I'll see how your folks are making out. Send them back over and get out of, get out of your way. But moving isn't, moving in's mighty thirsty work. I usually sit out on my porch about nine and have a couple of beers. In warm weather, I like to watch the night come on. Sometimes Norma joins me. You come over if you're a mind. Well, maybe I will, Lewis said, not intending to at all. The next thing would be an informal and free diagnosis of Norma's <clears throat> arthritis on the porch. He liked Crandall, liked his crooked grin, his offhand way of talking, his Yankee accent, which was not hard-edged at all, but so soft it was almost a drawl. A good man, Lewis thought, but doctors become leery of people fast. It was unfortunate. But sooner or later, even your best friends wanted medical advice, and with old people, there was no end to it. But don't look for me or stay up. We've had a hell of a day. Just so long as you know you don't need no engraved invitation, Crandall said. And there was something in the man's crooked grin that made Lewis feel that Crandall knew exactly what Lewis was thinking. He watched the old guy for a moment before joining the movers. Crandall walked straight and easily like a man of 60 instead of over 80. Lewis felt that first tug of affection. Hey, little one. Chapter 5. That was a quick change. Chapter. Chapter 5. 
By 9 o'clock, the movers were gone. Ellie and Gage, both exhausted, were sleeping in their new rooms. Gage in his crib, Ellie on a mattress on the floor, surrounded by a foothill of boxes. Her billions of Crayolas, whole, broken, and blunted. Her Sesame Street posters, her picture books, her clothes, heaven knew what else. And, of course, Church was with her, also sleeping and growling, rustly in the back of his throat. <laughs> okay, Lils. Th thank you. I love you. That rusty growl seemed the closest the big tom would come to purring. Rachel would prowl the house restlessly with Gage in her arms, earlier second-guessing the places where Lewis had told the uh, movers to leave things, getting them to arrange, change, or restack, rearrange, change, or restack. Lewis had not lost their check. It was still in his breast pocket, along with five ten-dollar bills he had put aside for a tip. When the van was finally emptied, he handed both the check and the cash over, nodded at their thanks, signed the bill of receipt, and stood on the porch, watching them head back to their big, big truck. He supposed they would probably stop over in Bangor and have a few beers to lay the dust. A couple of beers would go down well right now. That made him think of Judd Crandall again. He and Rachel sat at the kitchen table, and he saw the circles under his, her eyes. You, he said, go to bed. Doctor's orders, she asked, smiling a little. Yeah. Okay, she said, standing. I'm beat, and Gage is apt to be up in the night. You coming? He hesitated. I don't think so just yet. That old fellow across the street. Road. You call it a road out in the country. Or if you were judging Crandall, I guess you'll call it a rug. Okay, across the rug. <laughs> he invited me over for a beer. I think I'm going to take him up on it. I'm tired, but I'm just too jived up to sleep. Rachel smiled. You'll end up getting Norma Crandall to tell you where it hurts and what kind of mattress she sleeps on. Lewis laughed, thinking how funny, funny, and scary was the way wives could read their husbands' minds after a while. He was here when we needed him, he said. I can do him a favor, I guess. Barter system? He shrugged, unwilling and unsure. She wants to get my lap. Sure how to tell her that he had taken a liking to Crandall on short notice. How's his wife? Very sweet, Rachel said. Gage sat on her lap. I was surprised because he had a hard day, and you know he doesn't take very well to new people on short notice under the best of circumstances. And she had a dolly she, had, she let Eileen play with. How bad did you say her arthritis is? Quite bad. In a wheelchair? No, but she walks very slowly in her fingers. Rachel held her own. Slim fingers up and hooked them to claws to demonstrate. Lewis nodded. Anyway, don't be late, Lou. I get the creeps in strange houses. It won't be strange or long, Lewis said and kissed her. And we're on to chapter six. Okay. Lewis came back later, feeling small. No one asked him to <coughs> examine Norman Crandall when he crossed the street. Rudd, and he, rem he reminded himself, smiling. Lady had already retired for the night. Judd was a vague silhouette behind the screen of the enclosed porch. There was the comfortable squeak of a rocker and an old linoleum. Lewis knocked on the screen door, which rattled companionably, companionably against its frame. Crandall's cigarettes glowed like a large, peaceable firefly. In the summer darkness, from a radio low, came the voice of a Red Sox game, and all of it gave Lewis Creed the oddest feeling of coming home. Doc, Crandall said, I thought that was you. Hope you meant it about the beer, Lewis said, coming in. Oh, about beer, I never lie, Crandall said. A man who lies about beer makes enemies. Sit down, Doc. I put an extra couple on ice, just in case. The porch was long and narrow, furnished with rotten chairs and so sofas. Lewis sank into one and was surprised at how comfortable it was. At his left hand was a tin pail filled with ice cubes and a few cans of black label. He took one. Thank you, he said, and opened it. The first two swallows hit his throat like a blessing. More than welcome, Crandall said. I hope your time here will be a happy one, Doc. Amen, Lewis said. Say, if you want crackers or something, I could get some. I got a wedge of rat that's just about ripe. A wedge of what? Rat cheese. Crandall sounded faintly amused. Thanks, but just the beer will do me. Well, then, we'll just let her go, Crandall belched contentedly. Your wife gone to bed? Lewis asked, wondering why he was opening the door like this. Aya, yeah, sometimes she stays up, sometimes she don't. Her arthritis is quite painful, isn't it? You ever see a case that wasn't, Crandall asked? Lewis shook his head. I guess it's tolerable, Crandall said. She don't complain much. She's a good old girl, my Norma. There was a great and simple weight of affection in his voice. Out in Route 15, a tank or trunk 
truck drawn by one so big and long that for a moment Lewis couldn't see his house across the road. Written on the side just visible in the last light was the word Arinko. I used to think that the Arinko truck company was real because I'm, I'm actually from up this way. And they're not. I was convinced. Oh well. One hell of a big truck, Lewis commented. Arinko's near Orrington, Crandall said. Chemical fertilizer factory. They come and go all night. And the oil tankers and the dump trucks and the people who go to work in Bangor or Brewer and come home at night. He shook his head. That's the one thing about Ludlow I don't like anymore. That friggin' road. No peace from it. They go all day and all night. Wake no more up sometimes. Hell, wake me up sometimes and I sleep like a goddamn log. Lewis, who thought this strange main landscape almost eerily quiet after the constant roar of Chicago, only nodded his head. One day soon the Arabs will pull the plug and they'll be able to grow African violets right down the yellow line, Crandall said. You might be right. Lewis tilted his can back and was surprised to find it empty. Crandall laughed. You just grab yourself one to grow on, Doc. Lewis he hesitated and said, All right, but just one more. I have to be getting back. Sure you do. Ain't moving a bitch. It is, Lewis agreed. And then for a time they were silent. The silence was a comfortable one, as if they had known each other for a long time. There was a feeling about which Lewis had read in books, but this was a feeling about which Lewis had read in books, but which he had never experienced until now. He felt the shame of his casual thoughts about free medical advice earlier. On the road, a semi roared by, its running lights twinkling like earth stars. That's one mean road, all right, Crandall repeated thoughtfully, almost vaguely, and then turned to Lewis. There was a peculiar little smile on his seamed mouth. He poked the ch Chesterfield into, into one corner of the smile and popped a match with his thumbnail. You remember the path there that your little girl commented on? For a moment, Lewis didn't. Elliot commented on a whole catalog of things before finally collapsing for the night. Then he did remember. The wide moan patch winding up through the copse of trees and over the hill. Yes, I do. You promised to tell her about it sometime. I did, and I will, Crandall said. That path goes up into the woods about a mile and a half. The local kids around Route 15, a middle drive, keep it nice because they use it. Kids come and go. There's a lot more moving around than there used to be. When I was a boy, then you picked a place out and stuck to it, but they seem to tell each other in every spring. A bunch of them mows that path. They keep it nice all the summer long. That sounds like that's weird. Anyway, not all the adults in town knows it's there. A lot of them do, of course, but not all. Not by a long chalk. But all of the kids do. I'll bet on it. Know what's there? Pet cemetery, Crandall said. Pet cemetery? Lewis repeated, bemused. It's not as odd as it probably sounds, Crandall said, smoking and rocking. It's the road. He uses up a lot of animals, that road does. Dogs and cats, mostly, but that ain't all. One of those big Orinco trucks run down the pet raccoon the rider children used to keep. That was back, Christ, must have been in 73, maybe earlier. Before the state made keeping a coon or even a denatured skunk illegal anyway. Why did they do that? Rabies, Crandall said. Lots of rabies in Maine now. There was a big old St. Bernard. Went rabid down the state a couple of years ago. It killed four people. That's a mention of Cujo. That was a hell of a thing. Dog hadn't had his shots. If those foolish people had seen that dog had its shots, it never would have happened. But a coon or skunk, you can vaccinate it twice a year and still it don't always take. But that coon the rider boys had, that was... What the old times used to call a su sweet coon. It'll waddle right up to you, gory one, he fat, and lick your face like a dog. Their dad even paid a vet to castrate and declaw him. That must have bit cost him a f country fortune. A rider, he worked for IBM in Bangor. They went out to Colorado five years ago, maybe it was six. Funny to think of those two almost old enough to drive. Were they broken up over that coon? I guess they were. M Maddie cr rider cried so long his mom got scared and wanted to take... Take him to the doctor. I suppose it's over. he's over it now. But they never forget. When a good animal gets run down the road, a kid never forgets. Lewis's mind turned to Ellie as he had last seen her la seen her tonight, fast asleep at church, purring rustily on the foot of her, the mattress. 
My daughter's got a cat, he said. Winston Churchill. We call him Church for short. Do they climb when he walks? I beg your pardon, Lewis. I had no idea what he was talking about. He's still got his balls with that, or has he been fixed? No, Lewis said. No, he hasn't been fixed. In fact, there had been some trouble over that back in Chicago. Rachel had wanted to get Church neutered. Had he even made the appointment with a vet, Lewis canceled it. Even now, he wasn't really sure why. It wasn't anything as simple or as stupid or as equating his masculinity with that of his daughter's Tom, no, nor even his resentment at the idea that Church would ha have to be castrated so the fat housewife next door wouldn't need to be troubled with twisting down the lids of her plastic garbage cans. Those things had been part of it, but most of it had been a vague but strong feeling that it would destroy something in Church that he himself valued, that it would put out the go-to-hell look in the cat's green eyes. Finally, he had pointed out to Rachel that they were moving to the country, and it shouldn't be a problem. Now he, well, he got fox and coyote. Now he was <clears throat> judging Crandall, pointing out that part of country living in Ludlow consisted of dealing with R Route 15 and asking him if the cat was fixed. Try a little irony, Doctor Creed. It's good for your blood. I'll get him fixed. Crand I'd get him fixed. Crandall said crushing his smoke between his thumb and forefinger. A fixed cat don't tend to wander much. But if it's all the same time, but if it's all the time crossing back and forth, its luck will run out, and it'll end up there with the riders, kids coon, and little Timmy Dessler's cocker spaniel, and Missy Bradley's, Mrs. Bat Bradley's parakeet, not that the parakeet, he got run over the road, you understand, just went feet up one day. I'll take it under advisement, Lewis said. You do that, Crandall said and stood up. How's that beer doing? I'll, I believe I'll go in for a slice of old Mr. Rat after all. Beer's gone, Lewis said standing, and I ought to go, too. Big day to mom. Starting in at the university? Lewis nodded. The kids don't come back for two weeks, but by then I ought to know what I'm doing, don't you think? Yeah, if you don't know know where the pills are, I guess you'll have trouble. Crandall offered his hand, and look, Lewis shook, shook it. Mindful, again, of the fact that old bones pained Easily. Come on over any evening, he said. I want you to meet my Norma. Think she'd enjoy you. Okay. I'll do that, Lewis said. Nice to meet you, Judd. Same goes both ways. You'll settle in. May even stay a while. I hope you do. Lewis walked down the crazy paved path to the shoulder of the road and had to pause while yet another truck, this one followed by a line of five cars headed in the direction of Bucksport, passed by. Then raising his hand in a short salute, he crossed the street. Road, he reminded himself again, and letting let himself into his new house. It was quiet with the sounds of sleep. Ellie appeared not to have moved at all, and Gage was still in his crib, sleeping in typical Gage fashion, spread eagled his, on his back, a bottle with an easy, easy reach. Lewis paused there, looking in at his son, his heart abruptly filled, filling with a love for the boy so strong that it seemed almost dangerous. He supposed part of it was simple homesickness for all the familiar Chicago places and Chicago faces that were now gone, erased so efficiently by the miles that they might never have been at all. There's a lot more moving around there, around than there used to be. Used to be picked up. You, you picked a place out and stuck to it. There was some truth in that. He went to his son, and because there was no one there to see him do it, not even Rachel. He kissed his fingers and then pressed them lightly and briefly to Gage's cheek through the bars of the crib. Gage clucked and turned over on his side. Sleep well, baby, Lewis said. He undressed quietly and slipped into his half, half of the bed that was for now just two single mattresses pushed together on the floor. He felt the strain of the day beginning to pass. Rachel didn't stir. Unpacked boxes bulk, ghostly in the room. Just before sleep, Lewis hiked himself up on one elbow and, locked, and looked out the window. Their room was at the front of the house, and he could look across the road at the Crandall place. It was too dark to see shapes. On a moonlight night, moonlit night it would not have been, but he could see the cigarette ember over there, still up. He thought he'll, he'll maybe be up for a long time. The old sleep poorly. Perhaps they stand watch. Against what, Lewis was thinking about what, that when he slipped into sleep, he dreamed he was in Disney World driving a bright white van with a red cross on the side. Gage was beside him, and in the dream, Gage was at least ten years old. Church was in the white van's 
was on the white van's dashboard looking at Lewis with his bright green eyes. Now at Main Street by the 1890s train station, Mickey Mouse was shaking hands with children clustered around him, his big white cartoon gloves swallowing their small, trusting hands. So end of chapter 6. We're going to stop there today. And we'll start reading chapter 7 in the next video. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, hit that notification bell, and stay tuned for more of Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, more Stars Classic Books, and you have a great night.